Historical comparisons are always problematic, but here's one that's hard to avoid. The situation in Kashmir today is the closest India has come to the repeat of the terrible conditions we last saw during the emergency of Indira Gandhi. That emergency ran for around two years, from 1975 to 1977, and saw the mass arrest of opposition leaders and political activists. These were not radicals or extremists, or to use contemporary language, Naxals, whether urban or rural. The men and women arrested then included former ministers, former chief ministers, MPs and MLAs, and also scores of ordinary political workers. The media was tightly controlled through formal censorship, and the courts, though supposedly independent of the executive, functioned as an appendage of the government. The Supreme Court plumbed the lowest depths during that period when it ruled in the infamous ADM Jabalpur case that a citizen who feared for her life or liberty because of something the government had done would not have the fundamental right to approach a court for redress. This meant that if the government went after you, the doors of the courts were closed for you and your family. The reason I believe the situation in Kashmir today is like the emergency is because upwards of 4,000 people have been arrested in per capita terms, that's probably many more than Indira Gandhi locked up in her day, and millions of people have been subjected to a communication lockdown which bans them from communicating with each other via the internet or mobile phones, and yet the country's courts are not in a position to offer any proper help. In this episode of Beyond the Headlines, we will see how the only difference between Indira Gandhi's emergency and Narendra Modi's undeclared emergency is that the courts have not closed their doors this time. You are free to knock and free to enter, but once you do, no matter how urgent and pressing your plea, the court will show no urgency in even listening to you, let alone offering you relief. On Monday, Chief Justice of India Ranjan Gogoi made an extraordinary pronouncement. He said that all the petitions which had been filed before him since the unprecedented crackdown in Jammu and Kashmir began on August 4th, seeking relief from illegal arrest and detention, would be taken up by the constitution bench that he has set up to hear pleas that the scrapping of Article 370 is unconstitutional. We do not have time to hear so many matters, he declared. We have the constitution bench to hear. He meant, of course, the Ayodhya matter. Now, given the fact that habeas corpus petitions have been pending with him from at least mid-August, this represents an alarming ordering of judicial priorities. A title suit that has remained in court for decades is seen as more important than habeas corpus petitions, which, as every law student knows, can easily be matters of life and death. One of the petitions pending before the Chief Justice is the writ filed by child rights activist Shanta Sinha and Inakshi Ganguly asking that media reports about the authorities in Kashmir having detained young children illegally be probed. Surely this is not a matter that brooks any delay. If there is even one child being held by the state illegally and off the books, his or her speedy release is essential. The very concept of habeas corpus in law emerged because civilized societies cannot tolerate the state illegally depriving someone of their liberty. And habeas corpus petitions are, by definition, matters of great urgency because if the state is holding someone illegally, there is always the risk of that person being harmed. When the child detention matter was first raised before the Chief Justice earlier this month, he berated the petitioners for not first having approached the Jammu and Kashmir High Court. If only he had paid attention to other petitions filed before the Supreme Court, about the ban on communications, for example, or the fact that there are travel restrictions in place which have led to the police sending people back to Delhi from Srinagar Airport. He would have perhaps realized himself the impossibility of petitioners in Delhi approaching the High Court for redress through lawyers of their choice. It was only when he was given documentation to establish how the High Court has become virtually non-functional with the majority of cases brought before it since August 5th having been adjourned, 
that the CJI agreed to take on board the matter. He called for a fact-finding, but has now sent the petition itself on to the Constitution bench. Also with the Constitution bench are the various habeas corpus petitions of political leaders like CPIM MLA Yusuf Tarigami. Now, unlike the illegal detention of former Chief Minister Farooq Abdullah, which was challenged by Tamil Nadu MP Vaiko and converted by the centre into a so-called legal detention by slapping the Public Safety Act on him, Tarigami's incarceration has no legal basis. Yet the apex court has proved unwilling to demand that the government explain via a sworn affidavit on what basis it has deprived him of his liberty. The case of the former IAS officer turned politician Shah Faisal is even more disturbing. Faisal was stopped from boarding a flight at Delhi airport last month on the basis of a dodgy lookout circular that was evidently fabricated for the express purpose of preventing him from going abroad. He was then taken into custody by the Jammu and Kashmir police and illegally flown to Srinagar without the mandatory transit remand from a Delhi magistrate. In Srinagar, he was locked up under vague administrative detention rules. His wife challenged his detention in the Delhi High Court, but then withdrew her petition under mysterious circumstances. Clearly, the family had been threatened with unspecified consequences, including presumably the arrest of Shah Faisal under the PSA, if the habeas corpus petition was not withdrawn. That any person who enjoys the protection of the Indian constitution can simply be locked up at will by the government, no questions asked, is bad enough. But when those arrested include former chief ministers and mainstream politicians, whose election victories, incidentally, the government would tom-tom around the world as proof that the people of Kashmir are exercising their democratic rights within India, it is obvious that the situation in the valley is nothing short of an undeclared emergency. Sending these matters to the constitution bench means it is uncertain what kind of priority they will receive. For one, the bench will not sit every day. Even if the CGI felt he was busy, the matters might have been referred to some other bench where they could have been treated with the kind of urgency that they deserve. The constitution bench's primary role is to look at the legality of the manner in which Article 370 was amended and the state of Jammu and Kashmir bifurcated and then converted into two union territories. Every day's delay on that issue will make it easier for the government to claim a fait accompli. And so far, regrettably, the Supreme Court has made it easier for the centre to deny justice by simply delaying it.